Thank you so much and welcome everybody to our presentation. We are delighted to be with all of you today. Um, our presentation is entitled Toward Transformation for Student Mothers in Counselor Education and Supervision Doctoral Programs Lessons from the COVID-19 Pandemic. So CES is uh, You'll hear us use that acronym here, uh, but it does stand for Counselor Education and Supervision. My name is Dr. Joy Mwendwa. I am an Associate Professor at Liberty University. I am privileged to be co-presenting with some amazing women that you will meet here shortly. Uh, and before the rest of my colleagues introduce themselves, um, you will notice we have a lot of names, but you'll hear only a few other introductions. Uh, and that is honestly primarily because of this very topic. They're moms who uh, couldn't make it because of different um, issues and things that came up, blessings, and sometimes just some really difficult things, actually. And so we want to also honor them. They've contributed a great deal to this presentation. Uh, and so we also wanted to respect that as well. So, but I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get into the meat of things and have this conversation with you. Karen? Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. And I believe, uh, Jen, we're on the same timeline. So I appreciate um, that there's someone else that's up at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I am a PhD candidate. Um, and uh, my concentration is counseling and psychological studies. I'm studying at Regent University. I have six years of experience with um, counseling diverse populations. Um, I have a specialty in perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. I currently live in the Philippines. Um, however, I am providing um, online therapy for uh, Virginia students. And um, I'm also doing some counseling supervision for mental health counseling in Southeast Asia. Um, I do have experience with curriculum development and delivery among international stu uh, students, counseling students, and my research interests are global mental health, stigma, and help-seeking behaviors, as well as counselor education among marginalized populations. Okay, and Kirby. Thank you so much, ladies. Hi, my name is Kirby Mark, and I am also a PhD candidate at Liberty University, and I have the pleasure of presenting with um, Karen and one of my professors at Liberty, Dr. Joy Mwendwa. I am a school counselor and have been for the past nine years working with sixth graders and all of the developmental complexities of that age. I am also a licensed professional counselor and a nationally certified counselor. I absolutely love childhood development, uh, women empowerment and awareness, and also family. I am very, um, my disposition is, to, is towards keeping families together and making sure that there's awareness uh, among families about the structure and, and the dynamics between them. I am excited to talk about this topic with you guys, especially since I am pregnant while being a school counselor and doing all of the things working on my dissertation. So I can't wait until we dive into this and actually have a conversation about this topic. Thank you ladies. And thank you everybody who's made time to be with us again today. Uh, we have saved some time at the end so we can have um, some more conversation on this topic. I would like, as I mentioned a moment ago, to mention the names of our co-presenters who could not make it. Um, Dr. Shannon Mercer Pugh, Kat Luama Samot, Dr. Victoria Evans Fulton, and Jessica Wiggs. So for our time today, we're briefly going to cover three areas. We'll look briefly at the background, um, literature review on doctoral student persistence and attrition. 
we'll talk about academic motherhood experiences and how um, COVID really impacted this population. And then we'll end briefly uh, with implications and strategies. And again, we would really love to hear from all of you. So um, the US Bureau um, has actually information, uh, which I was, when I was preparing for this, I looked this up. It used to be for many years was just the 2% of the population had doctoral degrees, but that number has doubled since 2000. And it is now 4.5 million people have doctoral degrees, which is exciting, I think. Um, connected to that with such a low number, it goes to show just how difficult it is to attain that. Um, so there's been a lot of concern, a lot of studies that have surrounded attrition, persistence of doctoral students. Um, normally about only half of those who start actually finish a doctoral degree. So part of why this conversation is so important is because for mothers though, even that number um, can look different. And we'll talk about some of the factors that have really impacted um, mothers who are in the doctoral program. I would like to highlight that majority of what we'll be sharing is specifically about mothers who are in a counselor education and supervision program, since uh, many of us, not all of us, but many of us um, are in that program or connected to that. So the lit continues to highlight that for a student to actually persist and complete their degree, um, family, uh, the social and academic integration, all those factors are really important for one to really work through the ups and the downs of working through a program like this one. Rigor, expectations, assignments, research, and everything else that goes into a PhD program, one really needs support. And so um, having academic support, family support, social um, support is really important. Work-life family imbalance is one of the main factors um, that has been linked to why students actually don't complete and specifically some of the stress um, that can go into just the struggles of working through uh, a program like this one. And I can say even in my own life when I was um, working through my PhD degree, and this has been about 10 years now since I graduated, I remembered the stress that was there um, and I lived away from my family. Um, and so I would find myself sometimes calling my mom um, just for support. And we'll talk about some of the things that we've all kind of done as we're going through this journey or went in my case, went through this journey. But this specific bit of just the imbalance that comes with you're having to work, you're having life-related um, items that are on your plate, uh, family, um, dissertation, all, the, all those pieces can be very um, stressful for a doc student. The agenda inequities in academia, um, as the research has continued to show, um, and this has really been highlighted um, in terms of just how COVID, we'll get into, how COVID has really kind of shown a light on what those um, inequities have been. Um, majority of people in higher education have been men and males. And so uh, really trying to work through uh, kind of the navigate through this journey in some ways has put women, let alone just mothers uh, or women who have younger children uh, in a difficult uh, spot. So overall, doctoral students uh, with children and particularly younger children, the research says, um, experience more hardship than doctoral students who don't have children. And you might imagine uh, why, for example, uh, I was thinking of a moment when I was defending my dissertation and I had just had our son. Um, he was nine months when I defended, but I remember just 
going through that period and having to thankfully rely on the support of uh, my my husband, my partner, and uh, and I'm grateful for that because not everybody has that. But think, looking at other colleagues who didn't have children and they had their certainly their own. Um, struggles but it was completely different in terms of just how we navigated that process briefly let me just touch on some of the intersectionalities of academic motherhood uh, we face specific barriers as we're going through an academic program like i had mentioned sometimes we're vulnerable to different stresses uh, and therefore linked to attrition uh, sometimes that uh, imbalance uh, you're trying to integrate your different identities. You're being pulled in different di directions. You're trying to come to a presentation. You're trying to, uh, you know, attempt to travel or work towards a grant. Um, just again, all those are barriers that can really go to um, to hinder sometimes to hinder completion of a doctoral program. Some of the other pieces that academic mothers also have to consider are that many times they're often the ones who shoulder the domestic work and the caregiving work that is often found in a home. Um, so which would also mean added stress. As cute as those babies are, they're also work. Uh, or whether you're doing the hundred, you know, laundry in a month, load of laundry, or trying to navigate that extra piece. So cooking, um, again, can add to that stress. And so overall, again, just health concerns uh, because of the competing roles will lower life of quality and uh, in sometimes for these moms and also can reduce uh, motivation. Well, I'd like to invite Kirby to continue with our conversation um, at this point. Thank you, Dr. Joy. So let's have a real conversation, ladies, about COVID and what happened to our lives when it hit. So here we are, living life, everyone is in their routines, being a mom, being a professional, being a spouse, being a daughter, being all of the things that we are and then COVID hits, bam. I would love to open it up to hear some of your stories and how you were impacted briefly. So let's open it up for a second and see who would want to share right quick about the impact of COVID on you as it pertains to all of the things that you do as women. My name is Frida Artis, and I um, was and I'm on kidney dialysis. And immediately I had been asked by my physician prior to COVID if I was interested in learning to cannulate myself and to do my dialysis from home. But I really wasn't interested in that initially because when you're home, you don't you don't talk to anyone. All of my children are grown. It's just my husband and myself. And so who do I talk to during the day? So I didn't want to do it. But once COVID occurred, um, I did not want to be in a center. So I learned to do my dialysis at home and I've been doing it at home ever since. In the meantime, I was working on my, my um, 3,000 hours. I had worked as a senior technical editor for 23 years and was changing careers to uh, mental health. And it took me longer because I had the dialysis to attend to as well as I was not working full time in a clinic um, that would allow me to do my hours faster. So I um, worked on my hours at my pace. Um, I think it took about five out five years 
in addition to that, um, I had at the time some very challenging clients. I had clients who had suffered sexual molestation. And I needed to try to undergird them as best I could so that they could do their schoolwork um, and learn to participate. These clients, two of them had also lost their mother and were living with their grandparents. So in terms of how it impacted my life as far as the children in my life, um, I didn't see them having problems with going to school because they were pretty happy not to go to school. Um, but I was trying to get them to be diligent with their schoolwork. As far as how my husband and I um, corresponded at home, he took a um, furlough for three months so that he would not be encountering clients and bringing the COVID home to me. Um, so it was interesting that we had, uh, we were tied together for three months um, and not going out and encountering contact with other people. Um, and then at the end of the first winter, my mother, who was in a nursing facility, contracted COVID. At the time, we were told that usually in about six to 12 months, clients in facilities who contracted COVID often experienced a kidney or a heart event. And it was about 15 months later when she encountered the kidney event and eventually terminated. So I actually experienced the death of my mother who was 91 years old. And um, that is how it, it, um, it, I encountered it. I was very bitter because I felt that the facility wasn't as clean as it should have been. There were times that I went there and it wasn't. I made complaints to the ombudsman for Medicare, didn't get any feedback. So I really believe there've just been a lot of issues with COVID that have not been addressed. Absolutely, absolutely, Frida. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. You're welcome. Everything you said is so valid. And, and here we are feeling your pain with you and all of your concerns and what you said about so many questions and so many implications as it pertains to COVID in yeah. our personal lives. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. I can tell you guys that given my own case study, um, I had, I've had, you know, all of, I had an array of, feelings and situations um, that, you know, that also occurred. So for instance, in with regards to wearing all of the hats that I wear, um, I felt like as a student, because I have been, as, I was a student um, during COVID, I felt split between having to do assignments, 
having to go to class and have group meetings with, uh, with my classmates uh, while being quarantined at home. And then I felt divided between that and being a mom and structuring time for my kids. I have an eight, eight year old stepdaughter and I was actually pregnant with my first child with, with my son at the time. And so I had to structure that school time. I became school for, uh, for my stepdaughter making sure that she got her assignments done, that homework assignments were done, that she was engaged online. I was also the lunch lady with creating lunch and dinner and breakfast you know, for them. Um, I was also the nurse because if anyone got hurt outside, I I had to make sure that I I, I doctored that and 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 that they were okay. Um, yes, <laughs> Joey put recess. <laughs> Thank you, Joey. Yes, recess and making sure that they had fun and remained engaged. And that's just you know in all of the implications as a mother while pregnant. Right. As a wife, I had to make sure that my husband and I remained connected because just and let's be real, ladies, just because everyone was at home together all the time, it did not necessarily mean that you're connecting with your spouse. And so you had to schedule time to create with your spouse to continue that positive relationship and that you're 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 bonded. Right. And even through the quarantine period. Um, and also that goes with making sure that the family together got to spend some quality structured time together, not just watching TV, but also doing things that are engaging, like riding a bicycle and, and you had to, you know, feel alive and be happy for your kids um, while being impacted by the deaths that were occurring around us, um, like, like Frida shared in, in all of our loved ones that were being impacted. As a professional, because I'm a school counselor, I was at the forefront of crisis, right? Prevention and, and responsiveness for my students, for the staff, um, and for in creating a plan for my school to be able to respond to these many things that we just had no idea about. And so, how, well, what about me? What about Kirby? What about me as a person, right? What about you guys? What about you, Frida? What about all of you women as individuals as we were split between all of these different things? And so, Dr. Joe, if we go to the next slide, um, we can definitely um, determine that you know, COVID, of course, shut down schools, shut down daycares and all of the offices and all of the places that, um, that we would go and participate in on a regular basis. And so women, there was an exodus of women leaving the workforce and having to sacrifice all of the things that they had worked for because they had to become these different roles and professions in their home. That's what happened to us as women and and working at home i don't know about you guys but working at home caused me to work longer hours than i would if i had gone into my school building or into you know work building exactly <laughs> i had worked once as a remote employee uh, when i was out in it so i knew that was going to be the outcome when COVID happened with all women and, and employees who work from home, companies get a lot more out of you. Yes. Than they do when you go into the office. Yes, they do. And I actually believe that as a result of COVID, lots of companies realize that. Hence why, you know, they've been so laissez-faire about people working from home now because they get to get more hours out of them, especially if you're salaried and you don't have to pay them more. And so I'm going to throw it over to Karen so that she can share her case study with you guys as we continue this conversation. Thank you, Kirby. Um, I just want to um, 
actually thank Frida and you for sharing, um, because as you're sharing your stories and your experiences, um, we're all hearing a bit of our stories, um, whether it's caring for the kids or balancing, you know, um, just the chores around the house or um, trying to maintain that marital relationship, um, carrying our client workload, um, the health challenges, and for many of us, um, caring for older parents as well. Um, and so just really appreciate um, uh, the both of you sharing. Um, just a little bit about my experience. I was 43 years old um, when the pandemic hit. I was living in Northern Virginia with my husband and two children. Um, at the time, my son was 13 years old and he was in the seventh grade. My daughter um, was seven and she was in the second grade. And March of 2020, um, I just began to support them like so many other uh, parents, uh, right, with finishing up the school year virtually. Um, you know, I am in the sandwich generation. And so I was also not just worried about my children, but my aging parents that were living in New York City at the time. If you can remember New York City, um, you know, within the first few weeks of the lockdown, um, the city's infection rate was five times higher than the rest of the country. And so that was a lot of stress, um, especially with um, you know, my parents having some pre-existing um, health conditions. Um, and so that was really weighed on me. Um, what was interesting is I had actually decided to take a work sabbatical um, from private practice um, to pursue uh, my PhD. Um, so the, the whole idea was that um, I was gonna just take the first year off. I was gonna apply at the end of the year of 2019 and I was gonna take the first year off. And so um, when the pandemic hit, I had actually already gotten into my program and I was gonna start two months later. So, um, you know, as we're talking about this exodus that happened with people um, or women leaving work, I had already decided that I was gonna take some time off. So I started my online program in May of 2020. And, you know, just thinking of mothers and, um, you know, for me, I had not been in an academic environment uh, for seven years. And so I had a lot of questions. I was like, can I, can I even do this? Um, you know, what, what is this going to look like? Um, can I even write a paper anymore? I mean, these are things because I just didn't have to write academically in a while. Um, thank God, as we all know, it's still there. It, it doesn't go anywhere. It's still there. And I did really good uh, my first semester, despite everything. Um, but there were lots of challenges. There were a lot of challenges. And one thing that um, I did want to mention also is, um, you know, if we talk about the intersectionality between gender and race, um, you know, George Floyd had uh, been murdered 21 days after I started the program. And that was very heavy. Um, I have, I'm raising a black son. Um, and so I was concerned about discrimination or, or violence and as well uh, against my husband. So that was an extra burden that I had um, during this time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so I know we all had to make major decisions during this time, right? And a lot of them had to do with what are we going to do with our kids, <laughs> right? Um, I actually decided to, obviously, I didn't have a choice. Um, for, for the ending that school year. But for the following school year, I just decided that I was going to homeschool the kids. And I know that sounds very courageous. And I realized that not everyone, you know, had that opportunity to do that. Um, but I, I really, it was a video-based program. So please don't give me that much credit. Um, they pop the video in um, and they ask me questions, uh, but it really allowed me to be flexible. It allowed them to be flexible. One of the things that um, Frida, you said is they didn't want to go to school, right? Like it's just, it, it was a hard time and um, it really just led them to the flexibility that they needed with their projects and homework and time. I could give them the accommodations that they needed. And, you know, there were days where, you know, they were just like, mom, I just can't do it today. And I was like, that's okay. We can make it up. Um, so that was the type of flexibility that we had. And that's the flexibility that we needed. And I desperately needed it as well. Um, I was the lunch lady, the reset, you know, like I was just wearing all the hats, like so many of you. Um, and I'll talk about some of the coping and some of the things that I did, um, 
just to allow things to run smoothly. Um, so just managing that work-life balance. Um, I want to tell two stories. One is um, when very early in the semester, I would say the end of May, early um, July, my son was having some medical issues. And, um, you know, this is during COVID, right? And so I... Um, we tried to get some doctors virtually and that didn't work out. And I ended up taking him to the emergency room. And remember like during this time, like emergency room was like not a place that you want to be. Right. Um, but I had to take him to the emergency room at that point, he was not walking. And um, I remember bringing my laptop. I was bring I brought my articles and I had a discussion board that was due that evening. And I'm saying to myself, you know, I've, I've just got to, I just got to get this done. And it occurred to me that I actually had a seven day late pass. I don't know how many um, programs are actually offering that. I know that my university is not offering it anymore, but it was an option then. And, you know, I, this should have actually made me feel good. This should have actually made me feel like, okay, let me go ahead and use it. But instead, you know, an academic mother, I had this internal dialogue, this internal internal conflict. And what I was asking myself is, number one, um, is this too early to be using it? Right? Am I going to be penalized for using it? Am I going to be judged for using this? Um, and the other uh, side of that is, okay, if I use it, I'm not going to get another one. This is the only one that I'm going to get. And I don't know if I'm going to have any more emergencies. And of course, you know, worst case scenario, I can always apply for um, what is it like um, where you can uh, take the class at, incomplete, right? Like an incomplete, but just everything else that was going on. Um, let me see. You always want that in your back pocket. That's right. <laughs> That's right, Joey. Um, and so, you know, just this internal dialogue um, that I was having um, about using this, this pass um, that was available to me. And I wonder if anybody else was struggling um, the way that I was struggling, or was this like, because I'm an academic mom. And um, one of the things that um, I wanted to point out too, is that, you know, sometimes we're talking about coping, we can cope positively, we can cope negatively. And this superwoman uh, schema that we can have, where we project strength, and, you know, re we resist the feeling of vulnerability and dependence. And, and so that's kind of when I wasn't coping well, I thought I was coping well, but sometimes, you know, it's, I was just projecting this strength. And then it was always obvious. I don't know how many of you had this experience, but at the end of each semester, I would crash. It was like the adrenaline rush was gone. I was in a bad mood for one week. And it was like, the kids were like, my husband and my kids caught on to it. I didn't know the first time it happened. I was like, I don't know what this is. But then by the second semester, I was like, oh, this is definitely the crash that comes after. So everyone knew, like, just leave mom alone. She's just crashing from this semester. Um, just a good news story and um, something that, you know, looks at the sacrifice that we we have to make as moms is I remember maybe two years ago um, when things had quieted down a bit, um, my husband and things had opened up, my husband bought some tickets um, for the national uh, baseball game. And um, I realized that it was a conflict with one of the classes that I was going to have. And my program was remote um, or is remote. And um, I decided to still go to the game, um, but I sat in the car and, um, you know, just uh, had my collaborate class, kept the car off. So it was pretty hot. It was the summertime. Um, but, you know, this is kind of like the sacrifice that you make, right? Wanting that family time. Um, and I think that it was really good for my kids to see also like, you know, mom is making this sacrifice. So that's just like, for me, that's kind of like a good news story. I, I still remember that like, wow. And then this is it. Um, some of the strategies um, that many of you also had to do was just, um, I, I had to keep a daily routine that was meal planning and individualized school schedules. And, you know, I tried to match their school schedules that they had 
um, so it was similar um, timing wise um, to their public school education. And then I networked with other school moms. I joined social media sites. Um, I went for back massages once the lock, uh, lockdown was lifted, um, self-care. Um, I'm in uh, Southeast Asia now and back massages. Yes, <laughs> very affordable, very, very affordable. Um, I did this thing. I created what's called A and B time for my children um, because I was so, I, you know, after uh, a period of time, I just, I felt so bad that I kept telling them I'm busy or come back later. I just didn't want to use that language. And so I created A and B time. So they knew that if I said I'm on A time, I'm writing and the doors closed and like, I cannot be disturbed. So I would just say, and they say, mom, are you on A time? I'd say yes. And they would turn right back around and find my husband. Um, and then if I was on B time, that meant that you could actually, like I, was able to take your questions or be interrupted. And so I really liked the language that we had so that I was never saying no to them or come back or I'm busy. It was more like A time and B time. So just kind of reframing things for them. Um, I studied at night um, while everyone else was sleeping. I just needed that quiet time. Um, and then I integrated the family into my feedback. Sometimes, you know, my husband kind of looked at a discussion board for me and just, you know, spelling errors and things like that, or um, in terms of like just progress, the kids were always asking me, what classes are you taking? And then I would show them, you know, the classes that I'm taking, they would ask me if I'm studying for something, and then I would show them the grade that I got. So I really tried to incorporate the kids um, into my journey. And um, we know that religious coping is, um, can be a protective factor. And so prayers and meditations um, really kept me going as well and support from uh, friends and family. A dish. Thank you so much, Karen. I absolutely enjoy that, especially the A and B time. That's absolutely genius. So thank you so much for that. Um, I also uh, heard you mention, you know, about the the strength of a woman and how strong we are in doing all of these things, and. And I have actually been reflecting about that recently. I have made comments to my friends about like, hey, does anyone know where I can sign up for the weak line? Because I want to be weak. I don't want to be strong anymore. Sign me up for the weak line, please. Um, and I know, you know, we're being facetious. And, uh, but it's, it's just that the strength of a woman, we always talk about it, but we're tired. We're tired. And that is just the reality of, of the implications of all of these things. And so in discussing implications, right, um, what we want for our stakeholders and, and those people who make the decisions in, in a counselor CES program or in whatever setting you're in is just to have awareness of the pre-existing like long-held gender in, in, inequities institutionalized oppression, and all of those things, all of those roles that affect a, a mother and a woman, right? And the reality is we as women also have them. It's not just men. It's not just, you know, the world. We have our own preconceived notions that we need to be fully aware of as we move forward with um, our roles in all of these different areas. And the next slide, please. Also, and so in that we're talking about, you know, examining some of the personal and cultural implications that we're holding gender bias, assumptions, attitudes, or behaviors, and, and the policies that are created around that. Um, I know that as a pregnant mother um, that was dealing <laughs> with, um, I was pregnant during COVID, I'm pregnant now, I know that there are definitely some policies that have affected me personally as it pertains to maternity leave and all of the decisions that, um, that I have to make as a CES student and mom and all of the other things. Um, do I have enough leave to actually uh, bond with my baby? Do, do I have actually enough time to do both my dissertation and bond with my baby while taking care of my toddler and my other child? Like, what, what are some of those implications? And these are things that as, um, as stakeholders are considering the roles that we want them to keep in mind um, so that we can receive more support. Um, we have 
implications for uh, reinforce, reinforcement of academic mother identity integration, um, promotion of work life and family academic balance, and development of a support group and coping strategies. Karen talked about some phenomenal strategies to support um, moms, not just during COVID, but in any type of crisis or situation that I think would be applicable. Uh, but that also goes into talking to your support system and making sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who can help you, who can say, hey, you're going 100 miles per hour. It's time to kind of slow down or stop. Or what do you need? If it's water that you need, mom, let me go get your glass of water. Do you need 15 minutes? Do you, like, what is it that you need um, in order to be successful? Um, and I think it would also be important to... Um, have connections with other women within the CES programs so that the mentorship and the, and the support aspect can happen. Maybe there are other women out there that are doing it you know, better than we are that we can learn from, but these conversations are very important for us to have so that we're talking about the identity of a mother within these programs and how we can develop, the, develop it to receive more support. Um, let's see, next slide, Dr. Joy. Okay, so now we're gonna open it up for questions uh, and discussions. We are so, so grateful to have all of you wonderful um, women and attendees here. We would love to answer whatever questions or have a discussion um, about whatever is on your mind regarding the topic. Joey, <laughs> I saw you raise your hand. Thank you, ladies and mom, so much for for sharing. I I have a question, and I, I probably, of course, don't answer this if it's uncomfortable for you. I'm just wondering if any of you have gone through this. I'm still a single mom, and I'm going. To, are any are any of you or any of the, your research partners who can't be with us today um, have gone through the the academic experience without a partner and any tips and um, you know resources uh, for that. There's actually one um, who kind of went through, a, was in the process of a separation during this time. Uh, it was extremely difficult for them, uh, as you can imagine and one thing I saw that they did was they relied a lot on, um, they had a very supportive um, department. And so their, their faculty, some faculty members, specifically their advisor uh, was one. And then really something Kirby uh, and Karen talked about, just really finding other women um, to help. So um, I think their, their parent, um, their parent and the grandparent of their, their children are very supportive. Um, and then just other women in the program, just trying to find support to navigate through that. But absolutely, I think that's an even added piece to this that sometimes we don't always consider. Um, there's an added loneliness to that. That's a great question. Maybe the other ladies have something to add. Yeah, thank you. I remember when I was very newly single for my first master's degree, uh, the university um, uh, uh, UT in Knoxville had just closed adult student housing. And I went, I went, what am I doing? I can't do this. I can't do this. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. I think I'd watched them, you know, um, 2020 when it happened, they were going through this, this was um, extremely difficult. Can't even imagine with that. I think one thing that a single mother can do, because I did it a great deal when I was working on my master's, is I relied on friends. It was during the time when um, President Obama had said, if you're not working, go to school. And so a lot of people who had been resourced out and were receiving unemployment benefits enrolled in school because prior to that you couldn't. And so 
practically 50% of my friends enrolled in school. And they were all women who were pretty assertive um, and kept things going in their life. And so to talk with them about how they were handling the schoolwork, the children, if they had them, um, even one was still working. And she was a single mom, um, really helped um, talk with her about how she was handling things. Thank you so much for sharing. Ladies, that was a really good question, Joey. I think it's Any... a great question. I'm sorry, Carver was gonna say, I think it's not only a great question, but perhaps even for people in academia, an area that really needs research. Um, because like in this case, um, one of our colleagues who's not here today, um, this was her dissertation topic that kind of brought some of you know the content that we were able to share today but I'm curious just even for her and for other people this will be an area that can be explored in the future for sure absolutely any other questions or comments for discussion I guess, so I'll just say as a counselor educator um, in the role of counselor educator, um, I think it's obviously I think about this quite a bit um, and I think about it quite a bit for myself and my own perspective. Like I said in the chat, I work at home. Part of the reason why I work in an online program was because we didn't have means and access to childcare um, when I became pregnant. And so that was certainly something during COVID in COVID era that um, we, uh, my spouse and I sort of like planned around and planned for. Um, and so it's something I'm always sort of cognizant of for myself as an educator, but I think that this really helps uh, give me that gentle reminder um, that uh, my students and the students that I'm interacting with are just in the thick of it like I am. Um, and yeah, um, I am, I'm kind of out in the sticks uh, as Joey put it. Uh, I live in Appalachia, I live in Southeast Ohio. Um, and that's part of the reason why I live in a child care desert. Um, there's just no child care access uh, within a 30 mile radius of me. Um, and if there is, it's for children who are older than my child is. Um, and then I also have uh, the unique factor you can hear in the background. Um, I have the unique factor that I have a um, spouse that often works in a field. He works um, in natural resources and uh, does wildland firefighting during the summer and fall months. And so oftentimes it's just being by myself. Um, so yeah, it really, uh, again, it brings that perspective back to me as an educator that my students are going through just as much as I'm going through. Um, and I try to be aware of that. Um, but I think it's important to have the reminder also. So thank you all. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. McCormick. Um, I, oh, oh, so cute. See, here's the thing. The reality is like we, we, your child is the reminder, but thank you for also 
saying the uh, the obvious, but we, which we're grateful for. Yeah, the 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 ability or the idea of just being able to remember that our students are going through the same things that we are. Um, and even sometimes that vulnerability, like that's what I'm, I got from you just saying that you're being vulnerable and I can only imagine what that would do for your students to just hear and see and feel that. So thank you for that. Dr. McCormick. So, um, your baby is super cute, by the way, and, um, I wouldn't give your baby more than two ish. Am I correct about that? 18 months. Yeah. 18 months. Yes. I have one at home. So that's how I'm able to tell. Mm -hmm. But another thing um, that you made me think of is, you know, as, um, as we're having babies, right. We're, we're, we're pregnant. We're still doing all of the things. Another aspect of that is postpartum while we're doing all of these things. And I know I went through it, you know, during COVID with doing all of these things, like, how is that even possible, right? How, how are we doing it? Where is the support for that? And do we, are we even aware that we need the support? Are we aware of that? Yeah, no, I think it's a very, very valid point. And actually, so um, my clinical specialty now is perinatal mental health care, oh, and it wasn't perinatal mental health care until my postpartum experience. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that is a incredibly valid point um, that how do, how do, it, it goes back to that superwoman idea and mentality. Um, there have been a lot of times, even in my own life, and I know students have experienced this. I've talked about it with some of my students and my advisees is that idea that, well, if I don't get up and do it, nobody else is going to. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, we do what we do because we have to um, in a lot of ways. And it pushes us to a breaking point where we don't have, if we don't make the time for ourselves, we don't have the space in the room to take care of ourselves. But you can't pour from an empty cup either. Exactly. Exactly. Have all of you completed yes. your PhD programs at this point? Dr. Joy. But I, I'm still a student. Yes, I'm. I'm all but done. <laughs> Just my dissertation. I'm. I should. Yeah. I'm. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Um, I just wanted to chime in on the postpartum because I think that's really important. And, you know, that's also, um, I specialize in uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders as well. And um, one in seven, that that's what it is right now. One in seven will experience. And it's actually a spectrum. So I think that mothers are looking for depression, but it's more than depression. It could be anxiety. It could be OCD. Um, um, if there was a pre-existing condition for um, depression, it could be bipolar. Um, it could be PTSD from birth trauma. Um, there's there, It's a spectrum. Um, really. And so really being aware and continuing to have this conversation. And then another thing to be aware of is that um, if you are diagnosed with um, PMADS, that your spouse then becomes 50%. Uh, there's a 50% chance that he will also experience um, depression or anxiety. And so just looking at the whole family unit, um, and, and what the, what the implications are, of that are um, for for you know an academic mom yes and I'm just looking at the questions and can it be compounded with each additional pregnancy yes absolutely it becomes a risk factor um, it's a risk factor if you've had um, PMADS prior to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen, and all of you guys for, for just talking about this. I feel like we can really go for hours just discussing this and sharing our experiences, but also supporting each other. 
just know that um, you're all loved. You're all very important and valuable in what you do every single day um, in all of the hats that you wear. And, and there's definitely some room for more studies in the future. And so for now, thank you all for being here and for sharing this space with us. Yes, I want to echo that too. Thank you, Curvy, um, for saying that. And thank you for the men who support us. Thank you for the men who made time to be here today for this important conversation. Um, I think this is also equally important for us to hear how you all see ways to, you know, help us as we are helping you all. And so uh, definitely very much connected. So thank you to everybody. Okay. So it was great to be with you all, and I hope that we can continue this conversation. Okay, thank you, ladies. I think, do we have, there's one thing we're all going to take off to the, the keynote. Is that the last thing today? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, we'll see you guys there. <laughs>